Hi guys, my name is Gabs and today we're going to be looking at The Garden of Love by William Blake. Now this is an A-level poem from the Love Through the Ages syllabus. I adore William Blake because he was a rebel and he was a visionary. Quite literally, he would have prophetic visions of angels in trees and then he'd draw them. So I'd highly recommend you check the rest of his work out. And I want to attach three of my favorite images to the end of this deck. To start this tutorial, the first question I'm going to ask is, why should I care about this poem? I get it, if you're a student and if maybe you're an atheist, you might find it difficult to relate to Blake's point of view. However, you should care about this poem because it applies really well to a huge life lesson. This poem is about establishments and how they can cause oppression. So any system that becomes too powerful, too wrapped in rules and regulations, too focused on punishment rather than reward, too cold and machine-like rather than warm and relatable, you know, whether it be religion, a political party, or a corporation. These corporations, these organizations are supposed to serve the people. And as soon as they start serving themselves, this is when things start to go wrong. Can you think of any examples where this is happening right now? I encourage you to comment below. So for today's lesson, we are going to talk a little bit about William Blake. Then we're going to look at some historical context and then we'll analyze the poem and finish up with some analysis of rhyme, form and structure. So let's look at who William Blake was. William Blake was a Romantic era poet, engraver and artist who grew up in Soho, London. At age 10, he was enrolled in Parr's Drawing School at age 14, he was apprenticed to a master engraver. Then at age 21, he attended the Royal Academy. Now, most poets and writers came from wealthy aristocratic families, which meant they had the time and money to study all their lives, whereas most people from middle-class families like Blake's did not. Moving on to a little bit of context about the actual collection that The Garden of Love was published in. Songs of Innocence and Experience is his most famous poetry collection. Now, the book is split into two parts. The first half is titled Songs of Innocence, and the latter half is titled Songs of Experience. Now, the first part symbolizes an innocent, childlike view of the world, where nature is enrapturing and life is joyful. It embodies themes such as the seven heavenly virtues or cardinal virtues, which are prudence, justice, temperance, courage, faith, hope, and charity. Now, the second part, Songs of Experience, deals with the idea that when we become adults, we lose this childlike view. We become conditioned and adhere to strict rules and regulations, some of which ultimately cause pain and suffering, which make it more likely that we begin to think dark and immoral thoughts. It links to the seven deadly sins or cardinal sins, gluttony, greed, sloth, envy, wrath, pride and lust. Now, is the Garden of Love from the first part of the collection, Songs of Innocence, or the second part of the collection, Songs of Experience? I'm going to leave that question with you, and as we read through the poem, just keep that in the back of your mind, and I will answer that question at the end. Let's look at what was going on in Blake's world. So, William Blake was religious, but he was also a radical free thinker. He questioned the strict rules and regulations that religion imposed upon its people. He saw the dominant narrative of the church as oppressive and harmful. Blake believed religion should be based on pleasure, freedom and love. Blake was rising at a time when the Church of England was super powerful. This was a time when people believed that the working classes were poor because God made them poor and Therefore, they deserved to be poor. This was a time when women were owned by, owned like property by their husbands and fathers. This was a time when the slave trade was at its peak. This was a time when people were sent to the gallows for petty crimes. 
This was a time when the Industrial Revolution was picking up speed and people from rural parts of the country were all moving to the city to get jobs that were, quite frankly, long hours, back-breaking work. It was hard times. The church made people believe that they could only access God if they came to a place of worship, if they gave money to the church, if they obeyed, if they obeyed the rules and regulations that the church placed upon them. Whereas Blake saw through that and he realized that you could reach the divine, you could speak to the divine just by being in nature. So the church effectively disempowered people's individual right to communicate with God. It made them believe that the only way you could ever kind of adhere or be respected by God, speak to God, is by being in church, giving money to the church, adhering to the rules and regulations that the church stipulated upon its people. Whereas Blake knew that you could, you could divine with God just by being in nature. So now I've had my little rant, we can dive into the poem. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. What's most interesting to me about the whole poem is the pace. It begins quite slow and measured. And then slowly, slowly it picks up its speed in the second stanza. And then by the third stanza, Blake is overwhelmed with panic at just the way the church has desecrated or destroyed something he's, he held so dear. Let's look a little closer at stanza one. Blake capitalizes Garden of Love. By capitalizing the place, he draws attention to its importance. Yes, it's the title of the poem, but he's also referencing the Garden of Eden and the original sin. So according to the creation myth, Adam and Eve were the first humans to ever exist. God placed them in the Garden of Eden, where they lived in happiness or blissful ignorance, and he told them that they weren't allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, <laughs> Lucifer is disguised as a serpent, and he tempts Eve to eat an apple from the tree of knowledge. And when God finds out, he's pretty angry and banishes Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. I'm simplifying, but if you want to find out more about that, there's plenty of things online that you can look for. I mean, there are some interesting theories, like um, one theory is that the apples were actually psychedelic mushrooms and Eve had a psychedelic trip where she realized that she is one with the universe and that in itself was a kind of knowledge. Now that's not part of the, it's not part of the exam, so don't write that in the exam, but it's a theory that kind of should be in the exam. And uh, yeah, unfortunately isn't. Maybe they'll change the, the syllabus requirements next year. Who knows? Who knows? Then we have a use of the colon and saw what I never had seen. So when the colon is used in this way, it, it makes the reader eagerly anticipate what comes next. Blake could have said, you know, I saw something that I've never seen before but he's a genius and he's a poet. And he says it in a very succinct, distilled way, which heightens the drama. Colons are brilliant for when you want to distill your message and get it across in a very kind of cutthroat way. So I'd highly recommend you learn how to use them, especially if you're doing a speech. It can be very powerful. Now I've not highlighted this word midst, um, but I thought, thought there might be some confusion surrounding it because I was confused. So 
I first thought this word to mean mist, like the fog version of mist, because I'm kind of free associating uh, mist with the kind of gloomy, sombre things that are happening here. Uh, and I actually even Googled, you know, did we used to spell mist like M-I-D-S-T? But that's not the case. It just means in the middle. So M-I-D-S-T just means in the middle. It's an archaic way of saying that. So hopefully that's clear. Don't get confused. Then we have symbolism. The word play evokes memories of freedom and spontaneity, something that was lacking in the Church of England. Let's focus on the colour symbolism. So the colour green can be interpreted in two different ways. So either it's the physical description of the environment. Um, the colour green is associated with compassion, healing, generosity. Blake emphasises the importance of these green spaces, how they f facilitate physical play and joy. Physical play is that part of a child's life when they learn to use their imagination and play with friends. They learn their place in their friendship groups. They learn about their personality, their strengths, their weaknesses. It's a really important part of their life. They discover they can work together to have adventures and so much life happens right there on that little patch of green. If only we had the capacity to be brave and collaborate. Basically, play is training for adulthood. There's so much opportunity for playfulness in the everyday, but we often sacrifice that to go hashtag adulting. Um, but really, the only wrong way to play is to refuse to play. Let's look at stanza two. And the gates of this chapel were shut. If something is shut, it's cold and welcoming and friendly. Blake is explicitly saying the Church of England is all these things. Then we have the biblical reference, thou shalt not. Blake is referencing the Ten Commandments, which are ten biblical rules for ethics and worship. If you were to have broken one of the Ten Commandments, you would be punished. Notice the use of the full stop after the phrase, thou shalt not. This is an example of seizure, which creates a break in the line. So Blake makes the reader pause, even though the sentence then runs on. It's for dramatic effect. And hammers home the idea that the church is oppressive. It's harsh, it's guttural, and it can be felt in the sound of the poem. Next, we have sibilants with the lines, so many sweet flowers bore. The sibilance emphasises the abundance of flowers, the abundant opportunity to play and access the divine in nature who gives freely and unconditionally. And there are less rules to be found, unlike the church. Let's look at the last stanza, stanza three. Here we have something we've not seen before, polysyndeton. Now, the repetition of a conjunction is called a polysyndeton. Conjunctions are usually the in-between words of sentences, so things like and, for, but, yes, so. Here, Blake repeats the and just to stress how tragic and overwhelming the church has become. It's all-consuming and oppressive. Black gowns, the colour black links to power, authority, but also death and despair, implying that the Church of England uses its power to dominate and oppress. The plosives binding and briars. This repeated B sound is harsh, and to bind something is to wrap it tightly. Briars are these thorny bushes, so imagine thorny bushes being wrapped tightly. Sounds painful, right? Now, what's going on with the form and structure? So it's 12 lines in total. 12 is an even number. It's fair. It divides into itself, which contrasts against the unfair ideology of the church. Bit of tarot trivia for you. Number 12 is the hanged one. So this pictures a man hanging upside down by one leg. This card is about reflecting, going deep into yourself and looking at things from a different perspective, quite literally upside down. And here, 
Blake at a time when the church had so much power and remained largely unchallenged and obeyed unconditionally by millions of people, Blake quite rightly takes a different view and points out the flaws of religion. Each stanza is a quatrain. Now, a quatrain is a four-lined stanza. Again, the number four is even. It feels precise and fair, but remember, there are only three stanzas, so three is an odd number. The poem ends feeling unfinished. There's something jarring about the last few lines, like there's something more to be said. Maybe there should have been a fourth stanza written. Blake uses this sudden ending to illustrate the way the church oppresses the people, allowing no room for deviation from their rules and regulations. Now, the rhyme scheme is A, B, C, B, predominantly, especially in the first stanza. There's a playful nursery rhyme quality to stanza one, which makes sense because the speaker is reflecting on childhood and the place they used to play as a child. However, in the third stanza, there's no end line rhyme. Instead, there's internal rhyme quite sporadically. These rhymes are stressed to draw attention to the stifling harsh ways of the church. A briar is a thorny shrub. And this image is visceral because even this plant, this piece of nature that Blake adores so much is used against him by the church to cause him agony. It also alludes to the sacrifice of Jesus, because remember, when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, he wore a crown of thorns. Blake implies that to properly adhere to the Church of England's rules and regulations, you must sacrifice your joys and desires. Now, remember the question I asked at the beginning, is the Garden of Love from the Songs of Innocence part of the poetry collection or the Songs of Experience? The Garden of Love is from the Songs of Experience section. Now, you might have been tricked into thinking it was from the innocent section because it begins all innocent and childlike, but predominantly most of the poem is from a, a very sort of negative adult experience of growing up and seeing this church taking place of nature. So that is everything. Well done for sticking with it. Um, give this video a like and tell me your favorite thing that you learned today in the comments below. If you wanna hang out between lessons, come say hi on Instagram. And if you wanna get your hands on this entire deck with extra notes, head to my Patreon page. And remember, you can always request a one-to-one -one lesson with me and we can completely cater the lesson to your needs. So that's it for now. Um, thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. Bye.